Imagine being an examiner. It's seven o'clock in the evening, you're listening to the 70th piece of the day. You press play on this piece, and oh, it's another one that sounds really similar to the ones you've been listening to all day. This video is all about making sure that your piece is not one of those pieces. This is the second of two videos. Feel free to skip around to find what you're most interested in. You'll find timestamps for all the chapters in the description below. We've spoken to teachers, examiners, students, listened to lots and lots of students' pieces to analyze what works and what doesn't work to help you create piece that really is going to sell to the examiner or perhaps to any kind of listener. Just putting in notes that sound good together. This comes with a real skull and crossbones warning in exam pieces. Um, it's very much related to the um, writing bar by bar where you're just, here we go, I'll open this little piece and I'm just saying, hmm, what note goes with that one? that one. And what, all, what else could I add that goes with that note? So I'm not thinking about how those notes relate to what's come before or what's going to happen. I'm just dealing with this tiny little slice of time. There's a place for that, but it's usually at the editing stage or further down the creative process. Um, you're much more likely to uh, be working with a melody and a chord sequence or a melody and a bass line or a bass line and some beats and be thinking again in much, much longer periods of time. So here's a little example I've done with um, Olivia's piece where I've just input notes that sound okay together. Every chord sounds fine, but they're not flowing together. With that example, there's so many questions that an examiner would be asking. Is any of this material, is the bass line related to the top line or not? Is anything being repeated? Are there any motifs actually? Or is it just a sort of random load of notes that sort of sound okay? Um, unfortunately, it probably is just a load of random notes that sound okay. And that's definitely not what you want in an exam piece. I tried for years going direct, that moment of inspiration into the computer. Never worked for me. And for me, it worked getting your, getting your stuff together. Computers can take you uh, in, in that initial stage. You're easily distracted. Oh, I'm going to use that plugin and stuff like that. I would much rather get melodic, groove, feel. How does this make me feel? And, and also it gives you the chance to sort of dream up how the song can be. And I lived with that stage a long time. <laughs> I'm a professional composer and I know that if I write a piece that has a thousand notes, it's going to take ten times longer than a piece that has a hundred notes. And fast music has more notes than um, slow music. So it's really tempting, especially if you're up against a deadline like you are with exams, to write something that's slow because you can literally get through more of it in the time that you have allotted. Um, Unfortunately, it's really obvious to the examiner as well that that's what you're doing. And they will hear a lot of moderate or slow pieces when they're marking. If you do something that is fast, that's obviously had tons of work put into it, that has maybe lots of fast scale, um, which that would take a long time to input into a sequencer or a score, but it's a totally natural gesture to play on the piano or a big arpeggio. That's terribly played. Um, those kind of ideas take ages to input, but they're really, really amazing effects. I want to tell you about a, a, a real experience that I had working with a student who had been given the brief of making a piece of music that was appropriate for a circus, and she'd done a waltz. And I haven't got her exact composition, but I've sort of, from memory, done something which sounded a bit like what she did. So it was this kind of vibe. That sort of sound. And the chords were pretty good. It had lots of interesting scales and things. And my, but my immediate reaction was to say, why don't you just speed it up? Um, and she went, oh, yeah, but it's exactly the right length. I'm not sure that I want to. And they then played it to her at double speed. And in fact, I could triple the speed. And it wouldn't sound totally stupid.
promise you examiners won't hear many pieces that have got that are that are really fast paced have that sort of density of um, scale work going on so your piece will immediately stand out don't be sluggish not using the full range of the instrument it's so common to see student pieces written in a tiny span of the keyboard, basically because the uh, musician has only got a small keyboard to play. And so you get these very middling sort of range sounds, which is great, but there's also all this stuff up here. And all that stuff down there. Remember that sound, that you, there's so much more opportunity for variety, that you can actually get different tones you know, that's not just with different instruments, although they sound really different high and low. That would even be the same for a synth sound, where it might sound really down there, but maybe like this. Up there, much brighter. Um, it's a really common thing. If you're using electric instruments, remember that you have this octave shift button so you can make fully explore the range of the keyboard, even if you've only got a small keyboard. If you're working with acoustic instruments, if, if you know anyone who plays the instrument that you're interested in, get them to show you. Maybe even have a go yourself on the instrument. And you'll learn a massive amount about how the, the high and the low notes um, can have a massive impact on the way that your piece sounds. One thing that I am aware when I'm making a piece of music is I'm aware of frequencies or you know, notes. So there might be a case like you're working on something and you go, I need something at the top there. You know, something that suspends above, because I might not be writing full, either because I'm not a piano player or writing full chords, I might have the bass and some guitars down, but it might be something that hangs above there at the top. So I do take those things into account and I think they can be incredibly effective. Not enough detail. Now, it's not unheard of, but it's really unusual to see a professionally made score which doesn't have any detail on, doesn't have any articulation marks, doesn't have any uh, dynamic marks, any indication of tempo. But it happens quite a lot in exam pieces. You really need to be careful about it. So you've got articulation, so whether notes are joined up or whether they're short or long, for example, and dynamics, basically volume. Doesn't matter if they're real or computer generated, it's the same thing. You can put in crescendos, you can put in subtle tempo changes or really radical tempo changes. And you can be thinking about dynamics and articulations even if you're not writing anything down, like this synth here. I don't always have to have a fast attack. I could use a slow attack where the sound comes in gradually. And you may want to change these dynamics or articulations as your track develops. So here's an important point is that these articulations and these details aren't just things that are added on. Um, it's not like just sort of putting a, a shiny hat um, over your melody. They're actually intrinsic to your melody. So with Olivia's tune, the way that I've been playing it, I haven't been playing every note the same. I've always been playing short and longer notes, joining some up, making some more separate, like this. So I'm joining these ones up, then I'm doing a short note, then a long note, then a short note. So I'd need to put a staccato mark on those short notes and I wouldn't over the long notes. But that is the character of the tune. Da -da 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 -da. If you sing your tune into a phone, you will have all of those articulations preserved and you can go and listen to them and then notate your score accordingly. Dynamic markings, again, just aren't a way of just spicing up your piece. They can actually, but if you do a crescendo, and say you've got a piece that goes, and you do a crescendo, it's going to make you want to do something new with your piece and take it further. So it can actually inspire ideas. Here's a minefield. Examiners oftentimes aren't even supposed to be marking the score or the evidence that you send along with your piece, but they can't help but be influenced by what they see. And you want that to be a good influence, not a bad influence. You want to be clarifying your ideas, bringing anything that isn't obvious to their attention. So for example, if you've taken a bass line and put it on an inner part halfway through your tune, don't expect the examiner to be a genius. Just write the text box in that says, variation of idea B. And then they can see, if you're doing a brief for a film score, say, 
and your piece is called The Car Chase, then just call the various sections of your piece, you know, the tyre has a puncture or the cars go through the marketplace or whatever, so that the examiner can visualise the ideas that you're trying to uh, make a musical score for. In the real world, when you're writing music, um, a lot of the time, musicians wouldn't have seen it before. So um, you want to make their jobs easy and to save rehearsal time as well, because um, these things also, uh, you know, cost money. <laughs> so you have to think about that kind of thing as well, making, making everyone's lives easier. So how it looks is really important, I think. You can write a masterpiece with just a couple of chords, but in an exam you might find you haven't got enough harmonic interest. When I say harmonic interest, I mean that the chords aren't very interesting. Um, well, this is a really big subject, uh, probably too big for me to go into a lot of detail, but I guess I'm saying that, especially in an exam piece, it's quite dangerous to get yourself stuck in what we call a four chord trick. This is probably the chord sequence that you hear most. Four chords. For those of you with a lot of technical knowledge, um, that would be one, five, six, four. You can spin them around in, in different ways. The examiner may have heard that chord sequence a lot by the time they get around to listening to your piece. This one also happens a lot on this one. So there are certain chord sequences that, um, and they're all four chords long, which is pretty dangerous to use. So I guess I would really encourage you to look at the potential, what we call the implied harmony of, uh, of your melody. You may be surprised at the amount of chords that you can fit in. So even though Olivia's piece has three chords really, are the really obvious ones that are implied. G7, then back to C. So still three, I would say, are really obviously implied. But with a little bit of messing around, I think I played this example earlier on, the jazzy sort of example. I've used completely different chords. I'll try and... So it's the same tune, but you can get all these other chords out of that material. And for me, harmony can lift a piece. It can bring it sort of down. Um... You know, it I think is really useful and it can take the music somewhere else. Um, and it can, you know, it can create different moods. And of course, you can always change key altogether, like Olivia's tune does quite naturally. Starts in G. Oops, finds its way to C. Modulates, changes key, changes the home note to C. If you modulate, examiners love it. It's just you may be the only person they've heard that day that has done a modulation that'll make them smile. You know, modulating a key, I think it's another tool in the toolbox. And if, if, it, if I, there's a scene that needs something, that a modulation could help out a scene or an emotion, or in a song, if that lifts it or brings it to an emotion or a level where I want to take it, then I will definitely use it. It really just depends on the project and the scenario and what the music needs. In my early compositions, I didn't use so much modulation. As I've developed as a composer, I do tend to um, use modulation. Um, but I try not to think of it in an academic way. I do it based more on feelings. The harmony or the texture of your music not going with the lyrics. I can't tell you how many times I've heard student pieces where the, the lyric is all about whatever, torture and pain um, and anxiety and the music is incredibly sweet or vice versa. Really try and think about not just the overall texture of your piece but whether your piece is building to a piece of tension and then relaxing again over a longer period of time, whether the lyric actually goes with that. Um, you know, if you're talking about feeling better and better and better, and your piece is sat getting tenser and tenser and tenser, they're in contradiction. So you might just want to think about that one. Badly voiced chords. This is another big one, and it's another common thing that examiners will see. Let's say, you've got a chord sequence that goes, I've got one here on my screen, C minor, D7, G minor. 
this would be the typical way that um, a student who's not very confident with chords would voice the chords. They would go like this. And what they've done is had, they've had the bass line is always playing the note that the chord is named after, the root note. So they play C, D, G. And we have what we call root position chords where the bottom note, the C there, is always at the bottom. Nothing wrong with that, it sounds fine. But it jumps around. Sometimes that might be what you want, to jump around. But it's really worth learning how to um, voice your chords where the key note, the home note, isn't always at the bottom. So I could just do simply this, exactly the same chords, but listen to how different it sounds. Can you hear how the bass line's going up smoothly, not jumping? We call these kind of chords inversions. And I've got a really, it's much smoother sound now. That may not be what you want, but if it is, much smoother than, much less jumpy. Finally, on the subject of badly voiced chords, just remember how many options you have with a chord. I've seen C major written so many times there. C major could sound like a million things. They're all C major chords. Um, um, or hundreds of different ways of playing exactly the same three notes. Don't play the one that they've already heard a hundred times already. No tempo fluctuations, or another way of saying it, the speed's always the same. Now it's true that a lot of music, especially since the late 70s, is written to a click. A lot of the stuff that I've been working with, not all of it, but a lot of it has been written to a click. But a lot of musical genres, that's not the natural state of things. A lot of jazz is slightly fluid, a lot of styles like say tango or waltzes. Um, naturally get faster or slower at certain points of the music. If you're writing something in that style, really bear it in mind. If you send a track to the examiner which doesn't have any um, either sudden or gradual speed up or slow down, um, tempo changes, it might sound wrong. It might sound like you're not thinking in the right way. So really spend some time to try and get the most out of your software. It can be hard, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you, to get really good tempo changes, especially in the score writing programs, but it's worth spending that little bit of extra time to make it sound good. So a waltz, for example, might have these little... these little changes which feel idiomatically sort of uh, appropriate to the style that you're doing. So there's that, but there's also just the, the, the fact that you can create a completely different dramatic effect by changing the tempo of your piece. Um, so it's there as an option. Why not use it? I think tempo is another really cool creative tool that we can use. And yeah, there was an example in working on a really cool dark comedy TV series. And I wrote this, this kind of cool groovy end credits theme. And then the executive said, we need more energy. We need it to be a bit more, uh, yeah, just to have some bit more energy momentum in it. And so, yeah, I started tweaking and playing with the tempos and bringing it up. And, and then, yeah, it became, it became this, this kind of a bit more of a dancey track, you know, and it, and it kind of, and it, and it worked for the show. Not meeting the brief. You would have thought this goes without saying, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to say it. Make sure that you've actually read the brief properly and um, are listening to the, the kind of coded instructions the examiner is giving, giving you about what they want you to be searching for. If they've said instrumental, an instrumental piece, they're obviously wanting you to show your knowledge of the instrument. That's just one example. But overall, try and... Find a brief that doesn't cramp your style, that gives you ideas, that inspires you to make music that is interesting to you. I think having um, quite a strict and well-defined brief is very freeing. For me, creatively, it's really important. Um, it means that I know where I am at the beginning. So if someone says it's got to be in 3-4, I go, great. 
and then I'm off. I think it can be quite exciting to get a brief. How I might start changing it into music or translating it into music is once again reading through it and improvising <laughs> to it or listening to things that I think might fit the brief um, just to get inspiration if I'm really stuck. When I was applying for um, a, something, this Cameron Macintosh scheme, when I they gave you a brief on, it was a, uh, what was it, All My Sons? And I got a bit stuck with what I, so I read through the script and then I thought in my head, okay, well, what do I enjoy in? And what kind of sound worlds do I enjoy that um, relate to the to the, what the, the play is talking about or what this excerpt of the play is talking about? Um, so I guess I can, you can create your own brief in that sense and tailor it to what you enjoy doing and what's, what sounds you're comfortable with or what instrumentation you're comfortable with. Here's some particular problems if you're writing atonal or some other kind of experimental music. Atonal and experimental are not the same thing, where the theme gets buried and the examiner can't follow it. Now, this might be a thing that not many of you will try, but some people will, and I just want to point out some real problems, that if your theme isn't catchy, which a lot of atonal stuff is harder on the ear for you to memorise and for an examiner to memorise, then it can get buried and it just sounds like you're putting random notes in. If you make your theme nice and catchy, it allows you to do more. So I've taken Olivia's theme here, and I've made it into an atonal, I've taken the rhythm and made it into an atonal theme. Okay. I can now do quite a lot of processes to it, if you look here, I've done a mirror inversion and I've chucked it down two octaves. I've done a lot, but I think you can just about hear that it's the same idea. And you see what I've done there? I've just written mirror inversion as a text box. That would tell the examiner just in case they couldn't hear it. And I think they probably could have heard it. Um, it'll tell them that's what you're doing. So in a funny way, the same rules apply to music that sounds like this and more chords and melody music. You're trying to balance complexity and simplicity so that the listener can hear what you're up to and admire your craft and skill. No drama. A lot of pieces plod along with a similar kind of texture, a similar idea throughout. There may be verses and choruses, but they don't have dramatic changes between them. Drama doesn't necessarily mean sort of heavy or serious. Drama could be funny and light. It's just a change of dramatic um, emphasis. So it could be a drop down before a chorus of a hip hop tune. It could be a really sweet section in a horror movie soundtrack. There's loads of ways that you can push your material to dramatic extremes and it will make the examiner smile. Um, and see that you're, you're emotionally manipulating them in a way, and that that's a good thing. In The Ghost of Grenfell, actually the vocals take a backseat to the musicality. So it builds to a crescendo, and then it drops. And it drops to the point where you have the single voice singing. So that's the dramatic aspect of it. I don't consciously think about it, but I think it's that's in my taste of the stuff that I like. I like that contrast. You know, I call, it's like the yin and the yang. And I always, I know within Radiohead, there was always, if something was sounding too sweet or too nice, needed to be balanced by something that was maybe brutal or, 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 or a bit off. And I think that's really, really important. Now that's not for everyone, um, but, it, again, it, that's, that's like the light and shade thing. I think you need, great music has, has, has these two, the, the interplay of that. In pieces with a lot of instruments, they're all doing their own thing and they're not working together. So if you've got a few instruments in your piece, it's really unusual for at least some of them to not be working as a team together at some point in the piece. Let me play you an example using Olivia's tune. Yeah, I think with, with that, it sounds like there's a band and they're each individually playing their own parts for them, for them kind of. So I think it may be a cohesiveness of 
of thinking like, oh, okay, well, how can we make this, can, are these, we've got these cool elements, we've got these cool instruments. Is there a way to work them so that they're working together and not apart? So I've split this piece into just two teams, a really simple bit of organization of material. The right hand of the piano and the flute, playing in harmony. And the left hand of the piano and the bass, playing a rhythmic motif. And suddenly it has a bit of definition. It's definitely a quirky tune, but it's beginning to come together. Okay, rather than every instrument kind of on its own, doing different things. <laughs> oh, there's something about that that gives me a little bit of joy though, because it just sounds like everyone's having fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, everyone's having a little too much fun in that. Um, really, really busy. Um, everyone's, everyone's the lead, everything. No one's got any space. Everyone's just adding in as much as they possibly can and not leaving room for anyone else. Like if that was a live thing, I would say no one's listening to anyone else. Sections of a piece that aren't leading anywhere, they just stop. There's a million ways of writing a piece of music, but one thing that characterizes brilliantly written pieces is that that almost feels inevitable when the next section of a piece arrives. The first piece isn't just a good piece of music that lasts 30 seconds long. It's a piece that is building up your sense of expectation for the next section. Think of the bridge of Rolling in the Deep by Adele, um, where for 19 seconds she does this classic chord sequence that you hear in hundreds of songs. You hear it in Cindy Lauper's time after time. And she's going through that, the scars of my love, that little musical phrase, which does round and round and round. So building up tension, the music is building as well in volume until you finally hit the, the chorus and you get this massive sense of release. So she's built up the tension. That bridge isn't just a bridge that then stops. It's a bridge that is leading you somewhere really specific. It's really carefully made. So the chorus just sounds amazing when you get there. Nothing wrong with stepwise motion. Just be aware that um, it's the easiest thing to input. Uh, and so a lot of uh, weaker pieces use it exclusively. So just jumping a third or big leaps like an octave, like somewhere over the rainbow. Um, Olivia's tune does it. Massive jump up there will just naturally make your piece stand out because it's got these more unusual features. Don't be boring. It's perfectly possible for you to write a piece that gets absolutely top marks, literally top marks, and also you really like it, and it's in the sort of style of music that you're into. One big thing which I was really glad that I was taught and told is not being afraid to write how you want to write. So um, just your own voice, so what you're interested in. If you're more comfortable just making beats on something, then go for that. Or if you're more comfortable writing for guitar or on a guitar, then go for that. But I think there's always, um, sometimes you forget that your voice in composition is really important in developing that and being comfortable with that. And one other thing that I'd say is that remember that, that not every tune that you write will be the right tune to put in front of an examiner. If you come up with a brilliant four chord tune at 120 BPM, which doesn't really have that much um, harmonic interest and it's got a really repetitive tune, maybe you could turn that into a, maybe you'd have a number one hit with that tune, but it's just probably not the best suggestion to, to play for an exam piece.